had a pre-call with my guest, Dr. Brad Boyce, and he said that his public speaking journey was indeed a journey. And he hasn't reached and he hasn't reached the destination yet. So when I heard that, I really knew that I wanted to have him as a guest. He's a distinguished member of technical staff. I'm really curious to find out what that means. So I'm sure <laughs> you can fill that, fill me in on that. And he's also a vice president with the Minerals, Metals, and Materials Society, or TMS for short. I'm really interested to learn what he does as uh, as a as the vice president of that organization. So welcome to Teach the Geek Interviews, Dr. Boyce. Thanks, Neil. Good to be here with you. So from the research I did, I saw that you studied metallurgical engineering. Where did that interest come from? Well, in, in, when I was going to uh, college, I wanted to major in some sort of science and engineering field. My brother had majored in physics a few years ahead of me. He's four years older than me. And so I wanted to do something different. <laughs> and uh, I liked physics a lot. I liked uh, math and chemistry and, and so forth. I thought about mechanical engineering, but then I met with a material science professor. In fact, actually at the time I was majoring in general engineering and the material science professor said, well, you know, you can't get a degree in general engineering. So you should just pick one of them, one of the degree oriented programs. And I thought, well, you're a smart guy. Maybe I'll just major in your field. <laughs> <laughs> so I picked materials engineering as a starting point. It's sort of like a, let's pick something, which was his advice. And uh, I took his advice and wow. I've liked it ever since. So you're saying that if, if the, it was the mechanical engineering professor who said, pick something, you would have picked that? Probably. And I probably would have been just as happy. Who knows? <laughs> Isn't that something? I ended up, I actually studied materials engineering too. And it wasn't, it wasn't anything that was really planned out. So I ended up going to the school I went to because my father and I, well, well firstly, I was waitlisted. So I yeah. wasn't even initially admitted. So my yeah. father and I went down to the school and basically begged them to admit me. Oh, <laughs> and, then what it, and then what ended up happening is they said, well, all these other programs are filled. So you can either do geotechnical or you can do materials. Mm -hmm. And when, when I heard geotechnical, I thought mining. And when I heard mining, I thought you got to go up north somewhere. When I heard going up north somewhere, I thought cold. So I thought materials it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny how those decisions happen, isn't it? Indeed, it is. So, but you didn't start, you didn't, at least you didn't stop with a bachelor's. You ended up getting a PhD too. So what was the motivation to do that? Well, when I was an undergrad, I was lucky enough to get a uh, research position in one of the uh, professor's research groups and worked with a graduate student who was working on his PhD and really enjoy the intellectual challenge behind unraveling the mysteries of material science. It was particularly enlightening for me in college to realize the textbooks are not always right and there's a lot of gaps in these textbooks. And to realize that it was the PhDs that kind of corrected and filled the gaps of what we thought we knew about the field. Okay, but then you, you didn't stop there. Well, you did stop there. You finally, okay, you get a bachelor's, you get a PhD. How long did it take you to, to do all oh, the both of them? Long road. I think four years for the bachelor's and another five for the P master's and PhD. Oh, wow. Okay. So you were in school almost a decade. Okay. So yeah. now, okay. So now you're finally done. No more school. It's time to get out there and make real money. What kind of, what kind of work did you do when you left school? Well, I wanted to continue to do research, uh, but I wanted to do a engineering inspired research. So I uh, really liked the national lab settings where there was sort of a balance and there was a wide variety of different challenges and projects and a lot of rich funding and diverse interests at the national labs. I had been exposed a bit. In fact, my graduate school work was in association with Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And so I was particularly in tune to finding a national lab and I found a, a position to open at Sandia that was exactly my specialty and I was uh, very excited to be able to continue the work, the type of work I was doing before at a national lab as a staff member. Oh, wow. So you you basically worked in these type of, in the environment you're in, you've worked in it pretty much since you left school. Yeah, that's right. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, you must really like it because <laughs> I'm guessing you've, you've left school, uh, you know, no, yeah. not just not just not just yesterday. So you, you you've been up for a while. <laughs> it's been a few years, hasn't it? Thanks for reminding me. <laughs> so you know, I mentioned that you're uh, you are distinguished technical staff. So what yeah. does being distinguished technical staff entail? Uh, well, it's a promotion to the distinguished appointment. So t 
uh, Sandy is a pretty egalitarian, flat organization. All staff scientists are treated pretty much as equals, but there is a bit of a ladder for some salary and also a little bit of extra responsibility. Um, the distinguished staff in general, that's a position that's restricted to 10% of the population. So they, they want to make it distinct in some way. And uh, they do that by restricting the number of people that are eligible for it as a sort of a, I view it as a um, franchise tag, if you will. I don't know, that's not a perfect analogy, but it's the idea that they, you know, at that point in time when I was promoted to distinguish that sort of a deeper commitment and, uh, you know, comes with a few extra perks, if you will. Okay. So is this something that you apply for? Or is this something that they come to you and, and say, do you want to do this? Yeah, I think more the latter. They say, we think we would like to promote you to distinguished position. There's a sort of in, interview process and, uh, you know, sort of the, it's led by the management chain. The management chain sort of pulls you into this promotion. Uh, it's something that you just, you know, and, and a lot of people retire without this sort of promotion, you know, because it is so restrictive. It's not something, in my opinion, you don't you don't wait for it, and you don't. I don't. I didn't have the attitude of trying to game for it or trying to like target it. In fact, my goal at Sandia was just to be a good staff member. I just wanted to be a good researcher, and if I do well at that, who knows? Good things might happen, and that's the case here. Do you know why they wanted you to become distinguished technical staff? Uh, well, I think they respected the work I did, and they wanted to honor that. All right, got it. So in your role as distinguished technical staff, I mean, I know you did mention that the, the organization is rather flat. Do you manage people at all? Uh, in the formal sense, corporate formal management, I'm not a manager, uh, but I have several people that their technical research is is uh, guided by my projects. So I sort of I manage their technical research, if you will. Uh, in fact, I've got a few big teams right now I'm leading. One team is about 40 people. The other team is about 10. Okay. When it comes to managing people, it sounds a team of 40 and a team of 10, that's a lot of personalities to manage. What's yeah. something that you noticed about managing people that maybe you didn't anticipate? Yeah, I think I often assume that, boy, it's really hard. I assume that everybody thinks the way I do. <laughs> uh, that and, and that comes out across in so many different ways that uh, everybody, I assume everybody tolerates the same level of criticism that I tolerate, the same degree of feedback. I assume that everybody wants the same level of interaction that I want. And that those assumptions I've learned are horrible assumptions. Uh, I've learned that I have to tailor my approach to each person because different people have different styles. And, uh, you know, the way they want to interact, the type of feedback they want, uh, some really want to be told what to do next. Others want just wide open sky and they definitely do not ever want you to tell them what to do. <laughs> and so I try to with, uh, you know, as I continue to interact with people, I try to adjust my style to their preferences I can. Yeah. I mean, I've asked this question of other people who manage people. Do you have a leadership style or do you manage people the way they want to be managed or the way they want to be led? And uh, it's, it seems like uh, maybe it'd be the, the latter would be the best because you, you did mention that there's some people that want to be told what to do. Other people they want, don't, don't tell them what to do at all. And, but you have to figure out who those people are. <laughs> it's not that they come to you and say, I'm the type of person that wants to be told what to do. You know, it's just, it's, it's, if you don't tell them what to do and they don't do anything and then you realize they didn't do anything. So <laughs> not, and I'm going to be held responsible because I'm, I'm the person that's, you know, at, at the top of that, top of that totem pole is that then it's like, okay, I, I got to figure this out. Yeah. I'm trying to be even more conscious about that. And even in the interview process, start asking them questions. You know, how do you like to interact? Do you, would you rather have be part of virtual meetings or in-person meetings these days? Of course, that's a, you know, a question that we didn't used to ask, but now it's sort of a, an option. Like, do you do you prefer remote work, or uh, you know, do you want to meet once a week, once a day, once an hour, once a year? You know, those types of questions. Even at the interview, like, what type of interaction do you look for? And you asked whether you know. I, the real, unfortunately, the reality is, I do also sometimes have to uh, say, well, you know, the project needs this, so I, I'm hopeful that you can adjust your style to flex to the needs of the project sometimes as well. 
Yeah, it's like I, I actually I prefer to do a hundred percent remote. Man, you work in a lab. Why the hell you gonna do that remote? <laughs> That's gotta be a conversation. How can we make that work? How can we flex to meet in the middle? Or maybe this isn't a relationship that works. Yeah, yeah. You're you're absolutely right. There has to be some give and take. And I think a lot of times people they're they're real cool, they're real cool with the taking, not not all that growth with the giving. <laughs> some people are really flexible people, depending on the topic. And others are very, you know, rigid. They they want to do it their way. And uh, it's in those scenarios, if their rigid style doesn't mesh with the needs of the project, then eventually that, of course, doesn't work. But, um, you know, I luckily haven't had too many of those scenarios. Yeah, you want to do it your way, you best start your own company. <laughs> <laughs> Good way to do it. Yep. Yeah, man, you get in where you fit in. All right. So you, you mentioned, I mean, I, I mentioned in the intro that you're the vice president with, with TMS. How did you end up getting involved with, with TMS? Oh, boy, it started way back in grad school. Uh, TMS is a great forum for graduate students to present their work, their research. That's what I did. I presented at a TMS conference uh, a while back, <laughs> let's say it that way. And uh, then when I was a young staff member at Sandia, I continued to do that sort of thing. But then I realized through some mentors of mine that I could also be involved in the committees. They have technical committees, for example, in different topical domains. So my domain is mechanical behavior of materials. And there was a committee called mechanical behavior of materials. It seemed like a match made in heaven. So I started attending those meetings. And next thing you know, I was organizing conference symposia through that technical committee. And then a few years later, I was chair of that committee. And then uh, after that was over, I became director of programming for the entire TMS organization. And you know, that worked out well and got involved in some of the other facets of the organization, served on the board of directors, and now uh, applied a few years back for the what they call the presidential rotation cycle. So in a, two weeks, I'll become president of TMS. Oh, wow. I didn't realize it was so soon. So, yeah. all right. I can, well, congratulations on uh, your upcoming, your, I guess, your impending presidency. So when you, so your role as a as a as a VP, did you accomplish all the? I guess what were your goals as the VP, and did you accomplish them? Uh yeah. You know, uh, let me just say I had quite a few different goals, and some some were accomplished in some way. But I will say overall, uh, my original objectives and vision were uh, victim of the times. So the times prevail and I have to adjust and adapt according to what we're facing. And right now, uh, a lot of professional societies are facing uh, kind of the out, the recovery from COVID is the way I would describe it. And so, uh, you know, last year we did hold an in-person annual meeting. The annual meeting is our biggest event of the year. Uh, that's what will happen in two weeks. Last year we held it in Anaheim, California, and we had about you know, two thirds of the participation that we normally would get, but that's not really a sustainable situation for us because we built our organization around the the events and the offerings, the not just the events, but also the publications and content and member levels that we had pre-COVID. And uh, so what we're trying to do is re rebuild and build it even better this time, uh, make it even bigger. And in fact, I'm really excited to, to tell you today that actually we're uh, close to breaking record numbers this year at our annual meeting. And that's especially exciting because we're still suffering from some of the outcroppings of COVID. I mean, Chinese professionals now, while they can travel finally again, uh, it's too late for them to get a visa. By the time they learned that they could travel to the US, it wouldn't have been possible for them to come to the conference anyways. And there, I think we typically have about 500 Chinese attendees at our conference. so. We're still suffering the after effects of COVID, and and so a lot of a lot of what I've done as vice president has been helping the organization navigate through those after effects. Wow! So I'm guessing that now that they're able to travel, so maybe for next year's conference, you'll see that 500 Chinese attendees. I hope again. so. Look, you know, I think one of the the best part of a professional society is that we bring everybody together. Uh, we help unite people that share a common experience and a common challenge here, you know, material science or materials engineering. And uh, we are an international organization. We pride ourselves on participation from, I forget the count of the number of countries that we have, 
but it's um, something like 50 or something like that. It's a great number. We're a very international organization. We love that about it, TMS. And I hope that all of our international participants can participate next year. All right. So you're going to be the president in a couple of weeks. What are your goals as the president? Well, again, I, I, you know, sustained exactly this trajectory of uh, getting back. I don't want to say getting back to normal, but creating a new normal for the society. Uh, we're facing other challenges as well. You know, uh, the other areas we're, we're really trying to grow the society in terms of communications, but that's in light of the fact that this communication style is changing. In fact, among publications now, more and more people are using open access journals and that changes the financial model of disseminating knowledge. And so we're evolving the society in that way as well, uh, adapting to the times. Uh, I think my first principle is do no harm. I, you know, More than anything, TMS has got a great culture but I want to see TMS innovate and adapt, especially those new new topics that are emerging, artificial intelligence, um, uh, automated high throughput experimentation. Of course, a few years ago, there's a lot of excitement spinning up around high entropy alloys. We were very responsive to high entropy alloys. We were very responsive to um, other hot topics, uh, additive manufacturing. So I want to see TMS continue to embrace these emerging challenges that uh the the field is facing interesting yeah absolutely you know you know dr boyce when i first started this whole youtube channel and and podcast it was all about the the public speaking journeys of technical professionals and it still is and even the motivation for me starting it was my own struggles having to give presentations in front of others but me eventually seeing the benefit of getting better at doing it because well i had to do it in front of of management I didn't want to look like a fool every time I had to talk in front of the CEO. I wouldn't want that person to have a high opinion of me. So when it came to your, your I guess, your communications journey, your, your public speaking journey, when did you realize that being adept at communicating with others could be of benefit to you? Well, I think what I saw in others was the ability to fluently communicate. And I envied what I saw some, you know, some of my colleagues much more fluent in communication. I realized they're getting their ideas across and they're being heard. And, uh, and you know, I want to be part of that communication. We're, we're communicating for a reason. Uh, if we don't communicate effectively, then it's inefficient. And so I, I wanted to elevate the way I present content, the way I interact, the way I learn as well. And so uh, I think you know, I've been, a, as you said at the start, I've been on a journey. I still feel like I got a lot of work to do to communicate better, but uh, I've come a long way too, especially as a grad student. I always I struggled a lot with the nerves and everything else. Yeah, same here. I mean, and I, yeah, you're, you're right. I think it's a, it's a journey for everyone. It's kind of like destination unknown. It's like, when are you going to get there? It's like, there's a there to get to is always because there's always something you can improve on. Practice makes progress ultimately. So when it comes to the 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 presentations or the, the communicating that you do, do you have a process for for putting your presentations together? And if so, what is it? I suppose. I mean, it starts really more than anything. It starts at you know crafting the title around what I think the story is that I'm trying to tell. I really want the message to be crisp, and so that starts with the title. Sometimes, sometimes I admit when I submit the abstract, I'll have one title in mind, and and maybe as as my thinking evolves, the title may evolve as well, or as my learning evolves, uh, as the research comes in. But uh, really, the idea is, I want in a succinct way to share with you the essence through the title, and that sets the tone for the remainder of the the presentation or communication. From there, I want to think about what are the sequence of slides, the sequence of content, sequence of thoughts that get you to that title conclusion. So I want to take you on that, you know, take you on that path. Yeah, it makes that makes perfect sense. It, because when do you when do you have that process and, and you have the the thought of what the sequence is going to be that logically leads to what you want to convey at ultimately that, that kind of makes more sense. I have a, a friend, Dr. Boyce, and he makes fun of me because I have this process and I practice my presentations beforehand. And he does a lot more, I guess, speaking off the cuff, but you definitely can tell the difference. 
I, oh, yeah. I've I've sat <laughs> I've sat through, but I don't make fun of him though. But but I, but I just talk about him on this podcast. That's what I do. <laughs> but, but ultimately, but ultimately, when you when you present off the cuff, the, the information comes out the way it comes out, and it may not come out in the most optimal way. And especially for someone like yourself, that I'm sure talks a lot of uh, has a that does a whole lot of, of talking that that, re- that requires a lot of like, you know technical expertise. You do a lot of technical presentations. Especially if you're talking to a non-technical audience, and you don't put it in the best way that they can understand, or oh, you're gonna get people that are sleeping. You're gonna get people looking at their phones and, and staring off into space. That's right. That's yeah. right. You want to communicate efficiently. You don't want to waste people's time. You want to engage them. You want to keep them engaged. And and you're right. The the further outside of your specialty they are, perhaps the more carefully you need to prepare for that communication. Uh, when you're talking among a bunch of specialists and you're sort of uh, perhaps there is where off the cuff becomes a little bit less, a little more forgiving, I should say, because they understand the, the details, the words you're using. And, and so it's, um, you know, there's still a need for precision there as well, but there's a chance for being a little bit more interactive in, yeah. in that scenario. 100%. Because I mean, especially if you're talking to decision makers and they don't understand what you're talking about, well, the answer is going to be no. Yeah. Hundred percent, and that's of course a challenge for all science communication. Is when we have to simplify statements into concise uh, sound bites or whatever for those elevator pitches, and do it, but yet doing so in a way that respects the depth and detail of what you're trying to convey as well. That's that's a tough thing. Hundred percent, and don't call it dumbing dumbing it down. People don't like to hear that. <laughs> yeah, I guess we should call it elevating the. the you know, was it? There's a famous quote by Mark Twain. And I'm going to get the detailed quote wrong, but it's something to the effect of he was writing a letter to a friend. And he said, I would have written you a shorter letter, but I didn't have enough time. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, Mark Twain, he, I think he was, he was a pretty smart guy. I mean, he wrote Mark Sawyer, I mean, Tom Sawyer, for God's sake. So, you know, he had to be pretty, pretty smart and Huckleberry Finn. But yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. You, to, to get something in in a way that is precise. But but to the point, yeah, that that takes some time to to really figure out what can I cut out, and but it's still but what I present still makes sense and still gets the point across. And and for a lot of people, something that's really difficult because no, it all should be in there. But no, you better not put it all in there. But you're talking to not technical people to be like, look at this, all these words and this whole paragraph. No, I ain't reading all that. <laughs> I have some uh, some research students and postdocs that come to me and they're like, oh. Well, I'll just write a letters length article instead of a full length article. And I, I often at that point say, well, you know, it's harder and there's more intensity in how you have to write a short article because you have to compact all that information into a tighter message. You have less chance to pontificate or I should say uh, expound on the uh, details. You have yeah. to get it tightly and concisely communicated. Absolutely agree. You know, when it comes to the presentations that you give, do you ever get nervous before them? And if so, how do you deal with your nerves? Well, yeah, I definitely do uh, get nervous. And I think for me, it's a, I imagine the people that I'm, I mentioned that I really like admire several other public speakers and I imagine them speaking. I imagine myself like them speaking. I, I kind of translate how clean and crisp their communication is and I imagine me being that clean and crisp. I guess that's a visualization tool. Uh, it doesn't always work out perfectly, but I do think it helps me kind of calm my nerves and think about, I can do this. You know, I can I can be clean and crisp like that. Yeah, I, I'm a big fan of visualizing too. And, and I think it works. I, I, it, I definitely think it works. And it, at least it calms you down a bit. Although yeah. I, I, I actually had a guest recently, Dr. Connie Lynn, and she says to deal with her nerves, she wiggles her toes. <laughs> I, thought the most, I thought it was the weirdest thing she said. I was like, well, why would you wiggle your toes? And she says, when you wiggle your toes, you're focused more on the wiggling and not and less on the nervousness. That's, a, yeah. huh, that's really interesting. <laughs> I, I've also found sometimes I like to do, like, if I'm in the back of the room before a presentation or something where I'm not, you know, really in people's sight, I'll like even stretch out a little bit. I'll kind of get my blood flowing with some motion. So I, it won't be a toe wiggling, but I'll kind of move my body and stuff. Just kind of like trying to, because oftentimes you're in a scenario where, you know, there's been other presentations before or after you that you've been sitting through and you might not necessarily be kind of 
energized. And I want to kind of bring that energy and intensity to my presentation. So I don't want to, I want to kind of get the blood pumping ahead of time. I certainly when I'm presenting with the blood starts pumping, uh, you know, but uh, I like to kind of warm up, if you will, if physically. Yeah, I, 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 I think that's a smart idea. So you could do the visualization while doing push-ups. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know. Push-ups might be a bit extreme, but, you know, just getting out and getting loose and getting uh, even just getting excited. I think ultimately I, nobody wants to sit through a dry, boring presentation about somebody droning on about some theory or some result. Like if if the person doing the research isn't exciting, isn't excited, who's going to be <laughs> uh, like let's part of our job, I think, is to excite other people with the content, the, the message that we're trying to convey. I should say, you know, compel them into the ideas that you're trying to convey. And that really takes sort of you know, energy and intensity. And the best speakers, they come with that. They're just you know, that intensity is present. It's not about speed. It's not about loudness. It's about the underlying intensity and energy of their, their thoughts. I, I fully agree with you. So for the people who are listening or, or watching our conversation, Dr. Boyce, if you were to offer one tip that they could use to improve or to, you know, to, to, to get better at their presenting or public speaking in general, what would it be? Well, I liked what you said, that you practice ahead of time. Uh, practicing, doing public speaking, there's nothing better than doing it in the moment. I mean, I should say, what I'm trying to say is, Every time you have to do public speaking, you get better. But in preparation for each public speaking event, the more chances you give yourself to practice, uh, you can refine your content. Of course, you know, recording yourself is another way to elevate that. Uh, boy, it is a tough lesson. I despise it. But when I do, I get better. I despise recording myself, but uh, I can see the direct effect when I do it. I am a big fan of recording your presentations because I'm a forgetful person and I may remember it differently than it actually was. So I, when I go back to the recording, I, I'll listen to it and I think, oh, I didn't know I used that many filler words. I actually had a a, a, a client I worked with once and he sent me a couple of video of uh, yeah, videos of him giving presentations. And I, in the first one, I counted a hundred ums in a 40 minute presentation. And I highly doubted, I highly doubt that he would have remembered that he said, um, that many times. But I was able to tell him at one minute, 30 seconds, um, two minutes yeah. and 45, um. <laughs> and it was just, wow, that's that's a lot more ums than I thought. But you then once you know that, then you know where you have to improve from. Okay, I, I use that many ums this time. Let me try for much less of them the next time. And you can actually measure it. And that's how you get better at, at, at these yeah. type of things. I, I also like to uh, watch things like a TED Talk. I talked about how I I admire certain people's public speaking, but the, the TED format has sort of mastered the idea of communication in a way that wasn't elevated to that level before, typically. And so I, I watch those and think about what elements are reasonable to incorporate in the way I present. I'm trying to be more thoughtful about visualizations, new, less is more type of approach and things like that. Excellent. Well, Dr. Boyce, this has been a great conversation. Thank you so much for being a guest. How can people get in touch with you? Uh, my email address is blboyce, B-O-Y-C-E, at sandia.gov, or you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, that's a common social professional tool that I use. Excellent. Well, everyone, that marks the end of another edition of Teach the Geek Interviews. My name is Neil Thompson founder of Teach the Geek, and you can learn more about it at teachthegeek.com. Again, that's teachthegeek.com. Until next time, take care and stay safe. Thanks, Dr. Boyce. Thanks, Neil.